It's like getting into a bath, but the water is like warm chocolate pudding. And the Smiths are playing. There's a light that never goes out. Oh, there's one lighting all over, and there are like five dudes massaging you. <laughs> and you have a pizza. She's right, and you also have a pizza. Every time I open up a script, it's like you've got to be kidding. Who thought of this? Who writes this stuff? You know, you find yourself laughing and crying and, and hating the fact that you're laughing at the same time. I always say I feel like our writer's room is the land of misfit toys. <laughs> like, none of us totally fit in anywhere else. Genji really sets the tone for the whole thing. She doesn't really give us restrictions as to like what's on the table or what's off the table, and that's really great and really freeing. Everybody's voice counts in the room. You can chase a chicken for an entire episode, but then you can also have these really heartfelt, dramatic scenes between characters. I don't think I have ever come across a set of cutting edge, brilliant minds like this team. I think something that they've really done really well in the writer's room with this show is they keep the light in a place that could be very dark. You can't define it as a comedy only, and you can't define it as a drama only. Put a coconut in my sock. Bam! Sock a nut, bitch. I'm just playing. I think it's very subversive. The hypocrisy of being a human being is sort of so wonderfully explored. You must got some real big feet. I would love to just be in the writer's room for like maybe 15 minutes, just to, just to see how this all comes forward because they're just amazing. The writing process is super fun. <laughs> um, it, so there are, Eight of us, I think, uh, and we sit around a big table. We sit around a conference table and bullshit all day long. And we spend months just sort of talking about big ideas and deciding themes for the season and where we want our lead characters to go and establishing major story arcs for each of those people. Then in the next month, we sort of put those into episodes and start forming outlines, and then each writer goes off and writes their assigned script. When we premiered in season one, we all sort of like took the day off to like see what was gonna happen, like hoping that somebody might send a tweet, have you guys seen this new show? Um, so we were overwhelmed and thrilled by the response. That said, we sat down at the beginning of season two and kind of went, how are we gonna get out of this? Chapman, let's go, up, up, up. <laughs> On your feet. The first episode was kind of directly from the book, how she gets sent to testify. Where are we going? Into this van. And we said, yeah, that's going to be really cool. And the audience is going to think, what the hell? Have we have we gone to a new prison? And we just really talked about it in big broad strokes, and then we put it on the shelf. And we didn't actually shoot that episode until the end of our season because we wanted winter in New York. This so was a little bit of a challenge for Taylor and for us, but I think it came together pretty well. So what are you doing here? What am I doing here? For the trial, dumbass. It is beautiful up here in the fall. Oh, yeah, sure, I got myself incarcerated just so I could see the change in colors. Because we write in Los Angeles and shoot in New York, Genji really needs to be in LA to be in the room and to be monitoring story and ed editing and all of those things. So she's so wonderful in terms of empowering each one of us. So when it's their episode, they come and they're on set with us. And there's a lot of questions that can be asked really directly to the writer, which is wonderful and I find hugely helpful. And sometimes on set, you know, even while um, a scene is being filmed, you know, a, a line might come to me or an actor might suggest something, and they're usually game for last minute changes. It's like a tennis match where the ball just goes back and forth. You know, each episode, we they give us something, we take it and we serve it right back at them, and then they take it and they serve it right back at us. So it's, it's a perfect back and forth. Every actor wants to be involved in the process. But to be part of something where you get to really have a say 
in the development of your character is special. Yo, I miss that cream corn, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I give my left tip for a pina colada and a smoke, but you don't see that on the menu, right? That's the fun part, is to enter into that collaboration with them. We sort of grow together, and we make that character who it is together. I remember so specifically when Yael Stone, who plays Lorna, came into audition. I think Genji was the one who said it. Like, you just couldn't get her rhythm out of your head, and suddenly you knew who this person was. People always forget to remember I'm Trixie, huh? And then Uzo comes on board, and she does the first few episodes, and you stop writing Crazy Eyes, and you start writing for Uzo. Sometimes the feelings inside me get messy like dirt. And I like to clean things. Pretend the dirt is the feelings. And this floor is my mind. That is called coping. Or if I'm writing a scene for Red, it's specifically Kate who, you know, I know how she's gonna deliver this line. And so there are scenes that I'll write that I'm so excited because I'm like, oh my gosh, Kate is gonna kill this. Can I help? Just keep being Jane. I feel like I got this. Putting the jelly too close to the edges. You gotta even it out or it leaks. Is this happening? I met a woman uh, recently who was the mother of a fan that, you know, greeted me in a grocery store. And after her teenage daughter was finished making a fuss, she came over to me and she said, I just wanna say, I don't know who your people are or what, how they do it, but I am a psychologist and I work in prisons and you are getting it right. And I, I got all filled up. I said, you have no idea. We like to think that, but, but thank you. I think the great thing about all of our characters is that <laughs> we do try to see the universality of their stories. Sipe. Every one of those scenes draws you in and moves you along like being on a train going from car to car to car until you get to that caboose. It's astonishingly clever, uh, and you don't linger too long on anything, but enough seeds are put in your mind so that when a denouement happens, you are led back to where you were manipulated to so that intellectually it all comes together. It all gels so well. I'm sorry, Pete. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I'm sorry. I know. I know. <laughs> the writing does it for us. You just have to be a vehicle and be honest and open to the material. And the writer's doing it all for us. It's like magic time. It's the best combination of putting an actor and material together. You can't dump sick old ladies on the street. It's unconscionable, inhumane, and illegal. This just got real. It's so fun to write for good actors, and we have so many good actors on this show. I sit down at my computer, and I have Crazy Eyes, and I have Tasty, and I have Pensatucky, and I have these voices and these people that really feel like real people to me. And the fun of the show is that these women are in prison, and a lot of times they have nothing to do. I mean, you'll go to write a scene, and you're like, Nikki sits in her bunk, because where else is she? They're, they're in prison, they're stuck there. And so there's room to have these absurd conversations that you have in real life, that you don't often have on TV because you're too busy slamming through plot to try to get to the next thing. And some of the best stuff comes out of that. When Christopher's getting married on my date, just like we were supposed to. <laughs> Sorry. What kind of a woman doesn't want to pick her own date? Someone who doesn't get excited by the wedding industrial complex and society's bullshit need to infantilize grown women. Yeah, she's fat. I am curious to know what the conversations have to be in that room that lead them to all of these moments because they're brilliant. Now, don't be so juvenile, ladies. Listen up and learn, OK? Now, this is your vagina. This is your labia minora. And this is your urethra. This is where you pee from. The episode on the construction of the vagina. The whole episode shocked me. Just where do you pee? Is it, and where is the clitoris in relation to the pee hole? I went, mm, wow. I don't see why you need the funnel. Like, can't you just 
put the tube up in? Uh, no, because that's not where the pee comes out. <laughs> uh, yeah, dude. Out the big hole? Yeah. No, yeah, there's a different hole. For pee? Yeah. What? Sean was in a predominantly male writer's room before coming to Orange, and she was telling us this ridiculous story about how none of the men knew how many holes a woman has. And we were all like, oh my god, that's so crazy. Like, what a, what a bunch of assholes. Uh, and then throughout the course of the conversation, quickly realized that a majority of us also had no idea. <laughs> Y'all, there's the main coochie hole, and then there's like another little hole just for pee. Nah. I tell this to my husband and my mom, where do women pee out of? And they're like, oh my god. How could you not know that? <laughs> Didn't y'all take sex in? Yeah. And then they both kind of looked a little bit ashamed. And, and my husband said, well, I don't, is it like above the clitoris or below the clitoris? My mom was like, I don't know. I mean, it's, I think, and I'm like, mom, you're 65 years old. How do you not know? How do you not know? And how do you not know? And like, what the hell? Does nobody know? Meanwhile, I had to go check. Like, I had to go to the bathroom just so I could come back and be like, no, 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 I was right. I was right. <gasps> it was the urethra. And it's, you know, very specifically where I thought it was. Holy shit. Anyway, it turned into like the funniest thing. Apparently, a lot of people have questions about where the pee hole is. All this pee hole business. Like, what the fuck else do I know? So basically, we knew that we wanted to have this vagina hole conversation for a really long time. And when I got to that episode, I it felt like the perfect place to have it. And then so much fun to have Sophia be the one who has all the answers about the vagina. For the love of God, girls. The hole is not inside the hole. You have your vagina proper, then you have your clitoris. The urethra is located between the clit and the vagina inside the labia minora. For real? What's amazing about the vagina hole conversation is that's probably like a mild day in the writer's room. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you are all disgusting about <laughs> Take me somewhere now. It's really important to Genji, and I think she's really instilled in all of us that the sex should feel authentic and that the sex should look like, at the very least, everyone is really enjoying themselves and that we are seeing healthy depictions of sex no matter who's having it. I do you. There has to be a little leeway in writing sex scenes because it is always about when you get there, what the actor's comfortable doing, how the director oh, wants to shoot it. Oh my god. So you write the scene, which is always a little weird. I'm always like, do I write? Boobs, do I write tits? I don't really know. <laughs> Breasts seems a little formal. Like, I have that conversation in my head every time. It's a completely different thing when you're sitting alone in your house and you're like, ha, 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 this is so funny. She shoves her face in her crotch. And then you're on set watching human beings have to actually do it. I mean, there's a picture of my face sitting at Video Village watching the monitor, and like, I, I was like, I cannot believe, A, that I wrote this, it's so dirty, B, that they're doing it, and like, then it's gonna be out in the world, and wow, like, that happens. All the girls must want to have sex. Yes, Chang, we know, it's not a rape contest. What contest? We're having a bang off. I've learned a lot about lesbian sex from working on Orange is the New Black, mm -hmm. and I don't think I learned it as well as when I actually got on set and saw that some things don't work the way I thought they did. I don't know, I always feel like a little bit of a pimp when I'm on set, just like watching two girls take off their tops because I wrote it. Like, ugh, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> If I was watching Orange is the New Black and not in it, I'd be in love with these women because somehow you connect to them. Somehow their stories, you know, make sense and you realize, I know someone like that. Despite their current circumstances, we can all see a piece of ourselves in them. That none of us are entirely perfect and good people can make mistakes. Or what the show does is say, these people are not defined by what they have done that has sent them here. They are defined by who they are and their actions every day. You know, you were the first person that was nice to me when I got here. You made me feel like it was gonna be okay. I am gonna remember that you said that for my bad days. It's the humanity that they tap into and that the audience relates to. They want to know what happens to us. They want to know what, why, why is that wonderful woman here? What could she possibly have done? 
Aren't you in here because you changed yourself to a flagpole to nuclear test site? They're flawed in the way that human beings are flawed, not in the way that TV human beings are flawed. The fact that they're able to love each other despite seeing these flaws, I think makes us love them as well. This show is not simple. It's not lowest common denominator. It, it's pitching to the most complex ideas about, about human fragility. And it's also fun. <laughs> Nastrovia! Nastrovia!